So you just got drafted in the sixth round and you're happy and disappointed all at the same time. Or maybe you just signed a UDFA contract and now you got to go fight for a job as a UDFA. We're going to walk you through this process from the player perspective that Croc knows and then back to the front office and what that decision is all about today on Locked On NFL Draft. You are Locked On NFL Draft, your daily podcast covering the NFL Draft. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On NFL Draft Show. I'm your host, former NFL and NFL defensive back, Eric Crocker. And of course, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Tracy from Rogue Analytics and Locked On Chiefs. He's at Ryan Tracy NFL on Twitter. I'm at Eric underscore Crocker on Twitter. And you know, you can also find me on Locked On 49ers as well with my co-host Brian Peacock. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day and definitely have something that is kind of near and dear in my heart. The thing that makes it so I can start off this intro saying former NFL and AFL a football player, and I have a very unique experience. So I'm, I'm ready to kind of dive into this to give people kind of a peek behind the curtain of what it is truly like for some of these guys that were drafted late and what it's like, you know, just try, just trying to make it and some of the things that you right. have to battle against just to get a real opportunity. And th- that's the funny part. This is the part people don't talk about. You don't see this anywhere else that you can actually get some kind of of relatable exercise folks so enjoy this because it's real i'm not somebody who did that right i I was a slappy in college they're trying to get rid of they used to call me rudy like that's how dumb i was trying to think that i could play college football let alone a process like this and it's overwhelming at the beginning right so you go through the draft process it's draft weekend and you were able to sign a contract like from that moment forward, when your agent's like, here, we got your team, let's go do it. What do you what do you do? So my my experience was even more unique than that. All right. I was a guy that went to a division two school and didn't truly understand the direction I need to go after after college, right? You know, division two, small school. I knew I was gonna run a blazing time. So I actually went to the arena football league. And I did it, I did very well <laughs> as a rookie, you know, <laughs> and that kind of opened some doors and made it to where there were teams that were interested in, you know, my services and what I could potentially do. So I wish it was as simple as some of these other guys that just go undrafted. And as soon as you go undrafted, you know, or at the tail end of the seventh round, your phone is ringing off the hook because, well, the, you know, the team wants to bring you on and you're going to have a bunch of different teams to choose from and you can figure out what the best opportunity for you will be. For me, it was, okay, I, I have to put together these workout videos Teams get to look at it. They have me on their radar. The teams that like what they saw, which were they, they were actually a lot more than I was expecting. I would say about eight to ten teams that wanted to bring me in for workouts. Yeah. And uh, I had my first one. So my first workout was with the actual uh, with the New Orleans Saints, and they flew me down. This was Super Bowl week when the 49ers were playing the Baltimore Ravens. When the lights went out and all that stuff. But when all that was happening, or at least leading up to it. I was in New Orleans doing a private workout for those guys with uh, Rob Ryan, uh, obviously, you know, head coach Sean Payton there, uh, you know, their defensive coordinator. A lot of times these workouts are conducted by a defensive coordinator or a defensive back coach, a position coach. So I had a workout and, and this was not something that I was expecting. You know, I was actually at the time and I think this is the other part to this, right? Like the guys that either don't make it or after playing some of these smaller leagues. I was working at Macy's in the back room, making, you know, seven fifty yeah. an hour, working eight hours a day out in San Antonio, Texas. And, you know, the phone comes ringing and it's like, well, I have an opportunity. I knew from an athletic standpoint, I would be fine with what I look like in drills, but I didn't prep for a 40 yard dash. So when I went there, first thing they have you do, you run a 40 yard dash. I ran a four seven one. And the guy says, you, you don't know how to run a 40, huh? And I said, no, nah, I don't. Nope. And I um, ball. <laughs> so, not at all, right? You run a 471. So I went to the position drills and I killed it. You know, I mean, how, whatever they were looking for in a cornerback as being as long as I was, six foot two, 195 pounds, uh, you know, being able to drive in and out of my breaks, everything that they were looking for, like I was that. I just didn't run fast. So what they did was they said, all right, 
we can't sign you today because your 40 time wasn't good enough. But we can br- bring you in as a rookie uh, for rookie mini camp. And I'll talk about rookie mini camp and how that whole process is. But I was excited yeah. about that because to me, well, it was just an opportunity. So I went back. I, I flew in to San Antonio. I get a phone call from my agent. And he says, hey, Philadelphia Eagles, they're flying you in in a week. You need to go back to California, work on your 40 time, and then they'll fly you in from California. I said, awesome. So I went home. I worked on my 40 time literally for, it was three days, one hour each day. And uh, I flew back to Philadelphia. And next thing you know, I went from a 471 to a 453, just off working on my start, pretty much. So that tells you how wow. technical the 40 yard dash was. It wasn't that I couldn't run. It was I didn't know how to run it, run it and kind of cheat a little bit in certain areas. Some guys are just naturally fast. They're going to run fast regardless. But other guys need to yeah. understand how to run it. And um, so I went through that process. They didn't sign me. They were like, oh, you're too out of shape. And then all of a sudden, the, the Jets come calling. The Jets said, hey, after the combine, we're going to bring you in for a workout. So they saw the combine. Everything happened. They brought me in for a workout. And they didn't let me go. They ended up signing me there. So I don't think it was as simple for me as some of these other guys that just knew right away, well, you know, go on draft. I'm going to get these phone calls and things like that. To me, I was actually about to start gearing up to get ready for another arena football league and t- uh, season. And the calls started coming in and that was how I got signed. So a little bit, I guess you could say, you know, uh, un- unorthodox <laughs> in yeah. that way, but it was much different. And because I was coming from in a different league, that allowed me to go to OTA sooner, right? Like the rookies, they weren't able to report one after the draft and then even further after that for a rookie mini camp. Whereas me, I, mm. I was able to report in mid-April as a veteran. So I kind of got a gotcha. leg up on any of the other rookies that would be coming in. I got a chance to kind of get a head start on them just seeing me going through the phases of OTAs, which we'll get into, and also just kind of showcasing a little bit of my ability for a guy that was coming from, uh, you know, another league. Yeah, that helps a lot. We, we should probably start with rookie camp. So w- when we pick up, let's go right there. All right, so uh, we're going to get into rookie mini camp. What are the odds of guys making it in rookie mini camp? All right, and OTAs. Are they important? Are they not? A lot of people kind of dismiss OTAs. They are important for some people. We're going to get into all that and more. But first, definitely want to talk to you about our good folks over at Blue Nile. Whether you are ready to pop the question or you are celebrating a milestone moment, find a jewelry as unique as her and the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Blue Nile has a simple online tool that lets you choose the diamond shape size, and clarity, as well as setting the style. Our Blue Nile, you know, their bench drawers, with, they will handcuff her the perfect engagement ring. Each ring is a one-of-a-kind, and we all know that our women, our ladies, our special person, our significant person in our life, they actually kind of like something a little bit more specific, all right? And I was able to find mine uh, for, by my wife's best friend. She told me the kind of diamond that my wife would like, and then I was able to be able to go to a place like Blue Nile, and find the ring for her. All right, if you're looking for fine jewelry but having trouble choosing, Blue Nile has jewelry experts uh, on hand 24 seven, available via phone or chat to help you find the memorable gift for every person's budget. So whether you're balling like my guy Ryan Tracy or if you're balling on a budget like me, they have something for everyone. All right, make your make your moment sparkle with the jewelry from BlueNile.com and locked on NFL Draft listeners get $50 off the purchase of $500 or more. This podcast is exclusive and includes engagement. All right, use the promo code locked on. Again, that's promo code locked on. And every order is insured, it's shipped free, and it arrives discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So this can truly be a surprise. Shop, shop stress free and find your forever peace for your special person at Blue Nile. Dot com. We've good folks over here at Locked On NFL Draft. I want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. And of course, for your second listen of the day, you or third, you got Locked On Kansas City Chiefs, Locked On 49ers, and plenty of Locked On podcasts for your needs across this platform. All right. So you asked a question before, you kind of want to get into like rookie minicamp. 
And right. that's something where a lot of the guys that are drafted and maybe they also have second year guys in there too. At least from my mm -hmm. experience, there were some second year guys or even some third year guys that were trying to make the team. They were there at rookie minicamp. Just maybe they were off of the streets. And I'll tell you this, there were some guys that I thought performed well at rookie minicamp. I actually got hurt day one of rookie minicamp. And I was like, oh man, they're going to cut me. Because right. if they don't have much invested in you, you know, or maybe it's like a $10,000 signing bonus like I had, like, they will cut you and not care about that $10,000, yeah. all right? But I, I got hurt, and I, and I did whatever I had to do to fight through it. I was rehabbing around the clock each day, and I was able to make it through it. And, I mean, there are a lot of guys that were either just drafted or undrafted that go through that same situation. They, they get into rookie minicamp, something terribly happens, and the next thing you know, you look, and, you know, you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan, and you're looking at, well, well, well how did this guy get released? And they'll cut guys with an injury settlement or whatever they have to do, all right? But – I thought there were guys that were pretty talented there, but they didn't keep any of them. Now, you'll see some teams that will end up keeping one or two guys from the rookie minicamp tryout, but at least my experience with the Jets, I think it was extremely difficult. A lot of it was just figuring out to put enough numbers around the current guys that they had and their rookies to be able to uh, field a pretty much a three-day practice. So uh, I thought that was pretty fun. It was intense. I met a lot of guys that I actually ended up playing with later in the arena football league as well. There are some guys where I'm like, hey man, I play with you. I play with you. You're at rookie minicamp. So that was cool. But rookie minicamp definitely is something that was it was it was interesting. But it didn't stop there. Now you go straight from rookie minicamp into OTAs. And I think OTAs from a lot of fans' perspective is something that really doesn't matter. But I'll tell you this uh, OTAs definitely matters for the people like me. Uh, you know, guys that are truly trying to make this roster and trying to make an impact, they are going hard. Now, the unfortunate thing for the guys that are late round picks or undrafted rookie free agents, you don't get many reps. So the way it starts is right. if you're first string, you'll get five or six reps. And then second string, you get five or six. And then they repeat that. First string, five or six. Second string, five or six. And then third and fourth string that are kind of like lumped together, you will get the remaining of the reps, which might be three or four plays. And you really have to make the best of those plays because if anything goes too haywire there and it looks kind of funny, next thing you know, you're finding yourself on a one-way ticket out of wherever it is. And for me, it was Florham Park, New Jersey uh, for the New York Jets. So that's one thing I think that uh, people don't understand truly the business element of things. And when you're at the bottom, you don't have many opportunities and you truly have to make the most of every single opportunity. So I, I did well enough to where it was like, okay, we're going to keep this guy around, but still you're really fighting an uphill battle when you're one of the guys at the bottom. Well, and it's funny too, because what I notice in multiple teams around the league, it's not just what have you done in the past, but it's, it's a lot of taking that, like you said, just a couple of reps as an opportunity. Sometimes they ask you to do stuff that you didn't do in college that isn't you. They're trying right. to test you out and see how versatile you are, right? Trying to find a diamond in the rough. Did you go through that? I, so I did. Um, I remember doing my my workout. So my my position coaches were actually guys that played in the NFL. Uh, one, the defensive coordinator at the time was Dennis Thurman, and he was like a Cowboy grade, played safety for the Cowboys. Uh, very... I don't want to say cocky. I'll say confident, man. Um, I remember asking him because I didn't know anything about Dennis Thurman. Now, I knew Tim McDonald, and Tim McDonald was the defensive back coach. I knew Tim McDonald because he played with the 49ers, and I know he played with Arizona Cardinals as well. So Tim McDonald, I was aware of who he was, of course. But Dennis Thurman, I didn't know. But one day, I was talking to my junior college coach, and he was like, who's your defensive coordinator? And I said, oh, this guy named Dennis Thurman. He said, oh, man, Dennis Thurman, he was a great cowboy. So – I saw Dennis Thurman the next day. I asked him, I said, hey, you know, my coach, man, you know, from junior college, he asked about you. He said, oh, what he say? That I was this and that. Like, basically, like, yeah, I'm the baddest dude that ever lived. You know, like, that was the thing. I was like, oh, well, he didn't quite say that. But, yeah, you know, he said you were good. But, uh, you know, he was like, yeah, he probably wanted to be like me. Like, that was his thing. Like, he was so confident. And, uh, you know, a lot of what they did there as well was kind of breed that confidence into the players, whether it was Dennis Thurman, uh, and Rex, especially Rex Ryan. He's one of the best coaches I've ever been around. But just in the sense of, like, you know, trying to learn something new, they asked me, hey, have you ever played safety? Because I had good size. I'm like, no, but I can. But then you get into OTAs and you see how hard it is just for you to learn a cornerback position, a position for me that had been very simple throughout my life where, you know, you cover one, cover two, cover three, a few different variations, and that's it. There are so many different adjustments 
side adjustments, things that you have to know at the snap of a fingers playing in the NFL. I think it made it a lot more difficult to pick up. So I had to focus on cornerback where I wanted to kind of cross train and mm -hmm. learn safety as well. But all my focus went into playing the uh, cornerback position. Now, maybe if I had started out, out, out at safety, it would have been a little bit easier because, you know, they are the quarterbacks of the defense, at least in Rex Ryan's defense. The safety gets everybody aligned. And, you know, you got to understand, you know, the strengths and weaknesses. And maybe if I had played safety in the past, I would know more of that. But it was almost like speaking a foreign language, learning that. So that was a little bit more difficult. Wasn't able to do that. Well, and, and that's, the, I think, the key part. And what we'll get to next is, what is it for the clubs? What are they trying to do? What is OTAs for? You can read about that over at NFL33.com. I have a piece up there that you guys might want to check out. And I want to get your take on a couple of my thoughts here when we get back after this one. All right. Definitely want to talk to you now about betonline.com and how it is your number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. Find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup that is actually going on currently as we are recording right now. The Warriors are actually losing. I don't think a lot of people predicted that, but I did figure that Celtics would give them more of a challenge than people were believing. So if you believe like me, you go to BetOnline and maybe you go and you take the Boston Celtics to win the championship. They also have the NHL Conference Finals going on right now, Major League Baseball's, and of course, the latest fighting news in MMA and UFC and boxing. All right, BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head over right now to the website today to use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action going on at BetOnline, where the games start. All right, you got you to tell me the low down here because in my limited experience, I've never been on the player side, but I have done evals and I've gotten guys who've gotten to the, the workout level, trying to make a rookie camp, trying to make OTAs. And the thing that always struck me is it wasn't just the variation, the versatility that teams are looking for. If you're either a coach or front office exec, you're trying to find a guy that has enough value that you can take the risk on him. It's almost like you have to justify what you're doing already because it's not just like you said, Play a corner because that's what you've done. It's can you play safety? What can you do on special teams? How can you help the club? And that's where I think the most complex decisions come in. So from your experience and your player perspective, is it something that you had like, was it harder to learn special teams? Was it something you'd done in college? Or was that like a crash course right then? So it, it wasn't harder. I didn't do a whole lot of special teams in college. I, I did. I was a gunner. I would be a gunner. I would obviously be the cornerback on punt return unit. I would also do returns as well. I did some returns in college, but they took me off once I broke my jaw uh, heading into my senior year during spring ball uh, on uh, during punt returns. But, uh, you know, so I had some experience in that, but what the NFL was asking me to do, I had no experience doing that, actually being a blocker on the kickoff return unit. And, you know, in college is one thing, but when you get to the NFL and you have these guys – these defensive ends and outside linebackers that are six foot four, six five, 250 pounds, and they run faster than you, and you have to block this guy that's all muscle running full speed at you. I was not used to that, and I think ultimately <laughs> that was one of the things that got me released. Uh, you yeah. know, special teams is a big element of how you have to make it for some of these guys. We talked about it the other day. Justin Ross, are there any special teams aspects to his game? You said they have him back there returning punts. I don't know if Clemson ever had him return punts. I don't remember really seeing him back there, but if he's going to make it, you're going to have to see him contribute in different areas. And the guys that stick around that are undrafted, the guys that stick around that are late round picks, a lot of times they're going to make their niche on special teams. You know, I could cover. I didn't have an issue covering. I did well there. I couldn't figure it out on special teams where you would think it would just be like an effort thing, but it had to be more than that because I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> That, that's the hardest part. And for, for an exec on the other side, or when I was trying to train guys to try to help them get to that point, it's about adaptation, having your body correct so that you can then try to do something new that you're not used to. I think that that's the hardest part for when a, a front office is trying to put together. It, it's not the top 22. It's not the starters at every position. It's 45 through 55. We're now with the extended practice squad through what? 66. Like, or yeah. 69 is it 16 on the practice squad now right so that's the hard part because now you could even have to call somebody up from the practice squad as injuries rotate through you have to be able to do a lot of things at the bottom part of the roster and so i think at the end of the day you got to show athleticism sure 
but you got to have the mental acuity to learn all that and to be able to add on. When I talk special teams with some of the Chiefs players, it's it's about angles. It's about understanding what you're trying to attack and how you're trying to do that. And it changes every week. It's game planning as well as anything else. So it goes into a, we have to have guys that we can give an assignment to one week and totally flip it on them the next week, and they're able to keep up. Yeah, and, I mean, the special teams aspect of it, that's awesome. But also I think a lot of people don't understand the business element of things. I remember when I got cut for the first time, you know, it was – for something out of my control. Training camp has started, I was doing well, and I'll talk about kind of the bridge between, uh, you know, the the talent gap or lack thereof, and maybe some of the roster politics. But when I got released for the first time, it wasn't because of anything I was doing wrong. Well, Joe McKnight, rest in peace Joe McKnight, but Joe McKnight had a concussion, Chris Ivory had an ankle sprain, and Brian Winters had an ankle sprain. Mm. And they're like, well, we, we, we're not putting these guys on IR, so we have to release someone from somewhere else where we have depth to be able to sign guys to play in those positions. So, oh, okay, Eric Crocker, let's release him. You know, so that's the business side of things that I think a lot of people don't truly understand where something can really completely be out of your control when you are trying to make the team. Now, I will also say this, you know, where you where you play college, I'm not saying like that that's going to help you, but I noticed right away there wasn't a big – drop off in talent from me to, you know, whoever else was on the roster at the cornerback position. A, a lot of it was just guys that have been veterans. They have their niche on what they do. Guys like you know, my, my guy, Ellis Langster. Uh, I had um, the guy, uh, gosh, can't think of his name right now, cornerback, Trufant. But we had, the, it was like a, mm. there's like a miniature Trufant. So, you know, we know the big, the Marcus Trufant. Uh, right. You're Trufant talking Desmond, for right? Atlanta. Yeah, Desmond. And then there's Isaiah Trufant. That was who I was, right. was, was there with. Really tiny guy, but he just was amazing on special teams, right? So you know off top, like, they're going to keep some of those guys. And then you draft a guy like D. Milliner, number nine overall, and he's going to play no matter what it looks like. So D. Milliner yeah. came in, I'd say, from training camp. You know, there were some things that you could see right away where it's like, oh, well, you know, we'll see how he adjusts or whatever. He got there late. He missed all of offseason with a shoulder injury. But just with the roster politics, he was going to come in and play no matter what. And their main job was to prepare him. I never got the same attention – uh, you know, in the sense of getting me ready as he did, right? But again, he's coming from Alabama. He was the number one over, uh, number, first overall pick, their first pick. Uh, they also drafted Sheldon Richardson. But you could see, I didn't feel like he was better than me. But based Good. on roster politics, he was going to get that. He was going to get that spot regardless. And I think a lot of fans think there's just this huge talent gap. I don't think there is. There are a few special guys. So some of those special guys I saw, all right. Uh, and a lot of times they are the guys that are first round picks, uh, you know, uh, Antonio Comardi, see how big he was. I mean, this is a guy that in person is like 6'3", 220 pounds, but he was faster than everybody. He was extremely aggressive. He was very smart. I would watch him and how he moved, how he uh, presented himself as a veteran. You know, some of the things that he did, you know, I, I go in there to take care of my body in the morning, get in a hot tub and cold tub, do some contrasting. I'd see him in a hot, in a, in an ice bath, reading a book, you know, having reading <laughs> glasses on, he's reading a book, you know? So, you know, he took care of his body to the highest possible way you could. And that was how he prepared from a mental standpoint as well. So we see a guy like Antonio Camardi, the reason why he was able to play so long, it wasn't just his physical gifts. It was his attention to detail and understanding how to be a professional. There are a lot of guys that come into the NFL and they miss that aspect of things. They lose that side of things. They aren't preparing to the best of their ability and they are kind of trying to live off of athleticism like they did in college. And then you see mm -hmm. a quote unquote bust. And the reason why a lot of times, sometimes it could be the circumstances if you're a quarterback, but for some of these other guys that are high draft picks and you just don't see it work out, they don't truly understand how to be a professional. I learned from Antonio Camardi how to do that. Unfortunately, at the bottom, you just don't get a lot of opportunity. It makes it harder, but this is what the league is. It's not just your God given gifts. You got to work at it. You got to prepare for it. You got to maintain it. That's probably the biggest thing to longevity is making sure you take care of yourself so you can recover from what you put yourself through. The process is long and hard folks. And there's a lot to it. We're going to continue this series on Fridays, taking a look at some of the front office parts that go towards the evaluations and not just making a roster or making a draft selection, but what you do to stay on the team and help that team win 
that's something we're going to look through most of the summer, and we'll probably even take that into the season. So thanks for sharing your story, Croc. A lot of people hadn't he- heard it in such depth. So I know there's a lot more to it. We'll get more pieces as we go along. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions and you want to know more about the details, some of my experiences, uh, coaches I played for, Rex Ryan and how great of a coach I feel like he was, go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Eric underscore Crocker. And, of course, you can also follow my co-host, Ryan Tracy, at Ryan Tracy NFL. But that's going to do it for this episode of Locked On NFL Draft. We'll see y'all Monday. Peace.